difference from the Islamic world or leaning in that direction, and it's incendiary towards Israel. There's a fire, the same fire that was burning in the Ben Shemin forest. Just want to just want to burn burn it all down, and we're very vulnerable. And this past Lag Omer, which is our day, our day of the or of the tzaddikim, in my mind was camouflaged over by some of these terrible fires that were burning. And it's a concern. We have to know that our or, on the other side, to put it positively, our or is being challenged. It's reaching its final challenge. So you can look at it positively. That our or is really about to shine really, really brightly. So there's negativity that always comes at the last moment. But that doesn't mean that it's easy. It's like having a baby, right? The contractions are painful. OK, you're going to be very happy in a little bit. But right now, these, we're in these contractions and, uh, of the or of Hashem, and it's very, very painful. OK. And let's say, for example, what happened in Germany, where there's 200,000 Jews, an astronomical number. And what did they say this week that they cannot do? They should not wear a kippah. What is the kippah symbol of? They, 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 they know that Hashem is a God. Yeah, soul connection to Hashem. And that's what the world is saying. There is no such thing. Not for the Jewish people anymore. Okay. If there is, if there was one, we took it. Did you ever, ever Moshe Shapiro points this out, that Edom had to take a Jewish Messiah. Do you understand? It took Yashka, a Jewish Messiah. They couldn't do anything else. One of their own wouldn't work. It would be useless. All they can do is take the Jewish thing, because that's where the connection to Hashem is, and recast it in their own way. That's why the Pope has his, uh, his Jews, the witness people. Under that theory of witness, it has to be Jews who are going to identify. Right, and that's why they, they also the... Um, Evangelicals, you know, are, are are so crazy. They're crazy in love with Israel for very selfish reasons. Because they cannot, they know that their future, vision of their future, will only come about if the Jews accept their savior. Where? In the temple. They say they want the whole thing. First thing, give the Jews the land, let it build it up, all the prophecies, build the temple, and then we'll take over from here. That's their plan. And they're willing to invest billions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars. And thank God for them, at least we have a few voices that are pro-Israel. At least that much. This is a Hatsileni Nami Achi Miyare. Hatsileni Nami Achi Miyare Esau. Is your brother going to kill you or is it going to Pick your poison. But either way, what are they looking to do? Devour. Devour us. Okay. Like a fire devours. But let's go, let's go to Russia. What happens? What is this process? So, so he says, Rashi says like this. There are, in, in Bechukosai, we said that Hashem will punish us how many times for our, for our sins if we don't follow? Seven times. He repeats it three times. Seven, seven, seven. You don't, go, you don't do tshuva with the first set of problems? I'll hit you with seven fold problems. You don't do that? I'll give you another seven. Why seven? Why seven? Because the seven represents Shabbos, which is the departure point between the Goyim and the Jewish people. In fact, if you want to look at this, and I saw this in, in the Midrashim, the nations of the world really can accept the first three Dibros without a problem. Right? They could and should. See Hashem Anochi, which is that he created the light of the world. Lo Yebechah, because they shouldn't have any other gods, they shouldn't be, be idolatrous, they could agree to that. And uh, see, so they shouldn't um, pronounce God's name in vain, except for the seven, seven, except for the J witnesses, make it their life's purpose to defile the name of God, to make everybody else defile the name of God, you know, the work of them, the pamphlets and so on. Mm -hmm. You should only say the word out loud that we were told not to say out loud. So the first three of the Ten Commandments, like the first ten of the Sphiros, are really very universal. Where does it start to depart ways? On the fourth Dibor. What's the fourth Dibor? Zachar S. Yom That's only, only for the Jewish people. Now, 
What about there's Kaveh Rabbi? Oh, yeah, those, mm-hmm. well, those two. But also, you can realize, Kaveh as Abicha Vesimecha could be something that the nations of the world could understand and relate to. It makes sense. It's a logical mitzvah. Maybe not the extent that we have it, but they have Mother's Day and everybody dresses up in pink. It's a big deal. Now, Esav was very, very good at what? That's better than us. So it's the fourth Dibur where we part ways. And then the rest of them Lo Sirtzach, Lo Sinov, Lo Sibnov, Lo Sane, Berechai Chakir, Lo Sachmo. Purely logical. In fact, God's name does not appear in the second set of Rucha. The second, you know that? Hashem's name does not appear in the second five set of the Luchos. Why? It's very universal. It's not particular to the Jewish people. But what sets the tone for everything? If you don't have the Zacho Hashem Shabbos Lukacho preceding, right, the Kabe de Sabicha, and then the other, the next five, then the whole thing is off. Then you've got from or the Choshik to your point. This is why the seven is always the key. Shemitah, we've been learning about Bahar, all the things related to the sevens and the Yovel, it's all because the world hinges on the fourth deep world. Now, based on that, Rashi says, there are seven particular Averos that create a slippery slope from whence our shear gets its name. I'm moving further and further away from the light. And what is that? The first one is Lo Silmadu. You're not going to learn Torah. Well, what happens if you don't learn Torah? With a, with a melus, you cannot perform the mitzvahs because you don't know what to do. You don't know how to keep Shabbos, how to do Shemitah, how to make tefillin, how to do You don't know. You just don't know. You don't have the expertise. So, you don't know. Okay, but other people can tell you. So you also, okay, so you don't know. So you're ignorant. But there's people who are knowledgeable. So that's not so bad. So step one is not, you know, a deal breaker. But then the next one is losasu. You're going to stop doing it due to your lack of knowledge. You're not even going to know to ask anybody. So that's the second stage is you won't do it. But the third stage is already getting worse. Moes ba'acherim. You're going to start hating the Jews that are observed. You hear? They're going to become despicable to you. The next step, four, is sonei chachamim. You're going to not only dislike observant Jews, but you're going to dislike all of the rabbis too. You'll have a hatred. But you say, I don't like, you know, I, I don't like all these Orthodox Jews, but I have respect for the rabbi. You know what I mean? No. You start hating the rabbis, who are the ones who teach the Torah. And then, these last three steps are really tragic. Monea acherim. You will start trying to stop other Jews from keeping the commandments. You will say, that's not in our best interest that you keep all these mitzvahs. We have to embrace modernity. We have to embrace science. We have to embrace this, deep of this world. Enough. You know, get the Jews out of the ghetto, out of the pale of settlement. Let them get to work. Let them become communists, socialists or even capitalists, never chas uh, v'shalom, a Jew should say that, but then they all became capitalists anyway. So, you're going to stop the other Jews from doing it. Then, from that, but I'm going to be a good Jew, because I believe in God. I even believe in the Jewish people. That's the next step. Pope fair by mitzvahs. They start to say, God never gave us mitzvahs. There never was a matan Torah. That breach already is nearly final. Seventh step is kofer bakol. They will say that there is no God. They will profess atheism. I want to go over the slippery slope again because it's very, very important and it's very, very relevant. The first breach is no yeshiva education, no deep Talmud Torah. Breaching Talmud Torah, that's the first problem. What's going to emerge out of that? Step two, losasu. Mitzvos will be reduced in performance. You will be doing less mitzvahs. 
The third step, moes bacherim. Because you're not involved in it and you don't relate to it, then the people who do it are bothersome to you. So you'll start not liking those Orthodox Jews or ultra-Orthodox Jews, whatever you want to call them. Then comes the next level of sone chachami. You'll say, I don't, not only do I not like Jews, I don't like Judaism. I don't see it as having anything positive. The Talmud is not a positive. Sources are not a positive, necessarily. But they'll, they'll still accept what? The Bible, they'll still say that there was a revelation to the Jewish people. They'll just say, yeah, but the Talmud and the mitzvot does not interest me. The Chachamim are it. Well, of course, Judaism, I mean, I read the, I read the, I read the Bible, and I believe that we were chosen by God, and everything good. That was one level. But the next level is Monea Acherim. They will actively try to prevent Jews from performing mitzvahs. They will try to tear Jews away from the performance of mitzvahs. Like so many Jews did in communist Russia. So many Jews. Like so many Jews did in the Haskell, in the movement that, you know, where, um, where they tried to reduce Judaism and take us away from belief simple, pure belief in Hashem and mitzvahs. And then the, the next two steps, kofor by mitzvahs, denying revelation, we love it, you know, we're scientific people, we know that God doesn't speak to man, there's no such thing as prophecy, there's no such thing as God's will, blah, 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 it's all man-made. You know, the theory of Bible criticism that came in already in the late 18th century, and which is a product of, of modern science. And the last thing is kofor by kofor kol, that there is no God. I mean, scientists believe that there's God. They might not believe that there's God in the world, meaning in terms of running the world, but you know, many of them believe in the fact that God created the world. Einstein certainly believed that God created the world. He believed in God very much. He just didn't believe that he came and gave us mitzvahs. Okay? So that's the slippery slope. Now, um, so the Aseris Hadibros became the seven blessings. What's Hashem saying? If you use my or you use my light, you stay on the level of a male in the Torah, then you're going to get blessed. The land of Israel will become a mother that will produce for you. Okay? Does she have a mitzvah of Noah? That's a good question. The Medrash, the Medrash, the Balaturim quotes a Medrash that says, Hashem says, I'm going to send you to Gauls. The word is Ezare, which means to spread seed, to scatter seeds. So he says, what does that mean? It's, it's the Zion of that is the Zion Akuma. It's written imperfectly, like in a, in a, in a hunched over manner. Why? He says, because it's Kilu. Hashem is saying to us, I gave you the land of seven nations to fulfill the, the, the seven levels of wisdom. You know, the Torah is broken into seven books. I went over this once. You know, the midbrook is three books, really, that we're about, which we're about to enter. So there's seven lamps of wisdom, which represents the menorah, which represents the wisdom of Torah, right? And you didn't observe him. So therefore, and not only that, but you did shiva to'evos belivchem. You did the seven averos. You did the seven averos. You stopped learning Torah. Therefore, and therefore the slippery slope began. He says, ezare, I'm going to scatter you out into the nations of the world. The Zion akuma, because you didn't hold the Zion. And you could also explore the fact that the seven Canaanite nations probably represent each one of these. That's a little bit beyond the scope of our shir today, but I profess that probably we could match the seven umos, it's a little hard to do, to the, the seven nations of Canaan to these seven stages. And the ultimate kofar b'igbar, of course, really is Amalek, Edom Amalek, which is what we're really, really up against. Okay? So, listen to this. So says the Balaturim, in these ten blessings of the Chukosai, there are two letters that do not appear. One is the letter Samach, and one is the letter Pe. Okay? Now when you, why? Because he says Samach represents the Satan, even though you spell it with a sin. But it's also, the, the angel of the Satan is called, I don't want to say it, but yeah. the word for drugs in Israel is what? With the Samach. Samim, right? So that angel begins with Samach. And 
Pei. So put the word Samach and Pei together, and what does it spell? Sof. What does that mean? Mortality, end. That things end and disintegrate and destroy. That's the reality of the physical world, right? That's one of the rules of physics, is it not? That things will, will move towards deterioration unless there's some energy that keeps it going. It's exactly the truth. The aura of Hashem is the energy that keeps it going. But add the Yud, and what do you get? Yosef. The Yud of Yaakov and the Yud of Yosef to Sof, and all of a sudden, things continue to grow, proliferate. Life, Chius, Netzach. Why are Jews eternal? Because of the fourth commandment. Shabbos, because we kept the sevenfold, because we stayed away from the slippery slope. That is the secret to our eternity. Yosef is the secret to our eternity, which is why Shema Bayuchai made a promise. Shema Bayuchai came into Karen Biafna. What was Karen Biafna? Not the yeshiva over here, but she named after. What was Karen Biafna? The first yeshiva that was done immediately when? After the close of Kibbutz. Before. At the destruction of the temple. Oh. By whom? By Vespasian, the Roman emperor, who was the inheritor of the Greek knowledge. He says, I will let you keep a flame of Jewish knowledge alive. That's what he has to do. Keep the flame, keep the spark alive. And he said, Karim beyond. And what's Karim? Karim is a, a, vineyard. a vineyard, which grows what? Grapes. Grapes represent wisdom, represent the inner wisdom of the Torah, as well as the, the Dibre Chazal. The words of Chazal are considered like fine wine, right? That they get better. That's what he meant. Okay, that would be Exactly. He Rabbi Yehoshua. You know, that was the story. He says, he says, why do you think? So the, so the, so the woman, the, the uh, emperor's daughter says to him, oh, you know, why are you so ugly? Like, you know, ew. you can't be this wise person in such an ugly body. That's against the principles of Rome, Greece, which is all about aesthetics. Let's say a healthy mind in a healthy body, beauty. So how could you be the biggest chacham when you're so ugly? So he says, okay, let me tell you something. What does your father keep his wine in? Well, he keeps it in, um, you know, earthenware vessels. That's what preserves stuff. But we know from the Haftorah that Yirmiyahu and Avi was, was going to preserve the, the documents of sale. In what? In earthenware vessel, which they even found, what, later all the, in the Qumran caves, they found you could, you could put something in an earthenware vessel forever. That's its quality. And it's, go put your father's wine in, in gold and silver, which are the most shiny and beautiful. Which would make all your jewelry. Sure, she pours all the wine of her father into silver and golden vessels. Two weeks later, they come to serve him his party. He drinks the wine, spits it out. It's completely ruined. So she says, do you, know, do you now know why I look this way? He says, we have to be humble, be fair, we have to know who is the maker of the earth. It's not all about, it's not all about looks and gold and silver and exterior stuff. I have this beautiful light. What I have is really beauty, but you just have to understand and be able to interpret it. This is my own vort. You add the yud to the sof that enhances the Balaturim's idea. In the blessings, there is no sof, because there's only yo safe. Things that constantly multiply and grow, and you have more. And you know what the biggest bracha of all is? And I'll end with this. There's a question to carry over from last week. Ready? I asked you a question last week. I thought it was great. But that's a great question. The question is, and, and I found later that um, the Malbim brings Midrashim, and Rabbi Usher Weiss also speaks about it in the same way. Okay. The question is, Hashem gave us a promise that if we keep Shemitah, we get seven, then what's going to happen? Then we're going to have enough food, right, to last us through to which year? To the eighth year. To the ninth year. I'll tell you how. We're going to work the fields in the sixth year. We're going to get a really bountiful crop, enough to eat what? For the whole Shemitah year. And guess what? Now we need to work the land, which we can't even do to the beginning of the eighth year. So what are we going to eat in the eighth year? We'll have food for the eighth year. So it's, it's lasting for their, you know, they, they do it at the beginning of the year, you know what I'm saying? So whatever they harvested at the beginning 
Uh, they can't harvest in Shemitah. So they harvested in the sixth year. That lasted for sixth year, seventh year, eighth year. It says, in the ninth year, when you'll begin to eat what you work the land in the eighth year. The Torah, the promise of the ancient Torah and the discovery seminars, Arachim, all make a big deal about this. This is proof of God's, the divinity, the light of the Torah, because it's impossible. It's physically, scientifically impossible for such a thing to happen, or at least not likely. Why didn't Hashem give a bigger promise? Because once every 50 years you have Yovel, which means you have another year that you cannot work the land. Right? So how long is the rain going to have to last now? The sixth year, the seventh year, the eighth year, the ninth year, into the tenth year. So why did the Torah not give us the bigger promise? You understand? The Torah promises us in Parshat Bahar that we'll get, we'll have food into the ninth year. So the Malbim brings the Farshim that say really coded it. The Medrash, the Medrash deals with this. In the Psukim, there's ways to learn it that it means that it's referring to also to Yovel. But it's hidden. Why hide it? Say it openly. So I found one in those Medrashim, it says, you know, there's not going to be extra. It's just that what's there, when you feel a little bit of it, you're going to feel full. You're going to feel full. I said mud. It's not a quantitative thing anymore. It's quantitative for Shemitah. But when we're on the level of Yovel, we're in such a miraculous state that if you just eat a tiny bit, we're ready for it. I think that's the real answer. I said last week that the answer is when you come to Yovel, there are no questions. And, you know, Yovel, we're already at such a level, we have no questions. How did they presume? What's that? How was the food presumed? Oh, they had, they had, by the way, they, it's a whole discussion, but the Metro speaks about it. It says once get past one year, it's good forever. It really can last. How did Yosef do it? There's ways to preserve, like we said, with the food and the oats. Anyway, so I think those, those two answers go together. Either by in, in the Yovel we have no question we're in such a high, or because something happens and it's so miraculous that we can just do a little bit, like those Sadiqim, like the Baba Sali that we started with, used to take a bottle of Ara, wrap around the towel, and pour it for a thousand people. It was that he didn't have a thousand bottles of Ara miraculously. He had one bottle of Arach that gave out a thousand portions. Wow. You know, that, that's what it was. That's the bracha, that's right now. That's the bracha I give to everybody that we should have Parnassah in Eretz Yisrael. It doesn't have to be quantitatively huge, but it has to be enough to satisfy all the needs. That's really the key. That's the miracle. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, how do you see Paul? This is my last word here. The end of the parsha, after all these kolos, there's a hot, there's there's a parsha called Erechim, valuation. It works like this. If you say, I want to give myself to the base of Mikdash, or this other guy, the base of Mikdash, 50 shekel, if you're between 20 and 60. For a woman, 30 shekel. For, for a teenager, so and so. For a baby, so and so. The total number is 143. If you add up all the valuations for all the different ages, it's 143. Says the Balatur. That's the amount of curses that are in the book of Mayikra. There are um, 40, uh, 40, 45 curses, and in Dvarim, you're going to get another 98 curses in the Tokha and Dvarim. So, therefore, the, the, this thing about giving the valuations to the base of Mikdash counteracts all of these. How does it counteract it exactly? Well, it's a Dr. Tatsi Ami Mabes, that's one thing. But it's, but it's more, it's like I'm giving your value, I, I donate you to the base of Mikdash. You know, so that's the answer is yes. If you're gonna you want out of all this, all this mess, dedicate dedicate yourself Lashem. Dedicate, be a male of the Torah. Just get say I'm gonna do what Hashem. I really want to devote myself to Hashem. I want to devote myself to Kedusha. That's the counteract. That's an unbelievable shot. That that we have to have Erechim. We have to see the value of devoting our life to Hashem. And that's when we reach a hundred Amos. You know why hundred Amos? Because how tall is the base of Mikdash? The Heichal. A hundred amos tall. That's what it means that we're going to be a hundred amos tall when it's koma miyut. Because we're going to be kulo for our Shem for the base. Mock this ourselves for Hashem. And when we reach that point and we're filled with Hashem's light, we'll, as if we're a hundred amos tall, because we've all built the base Hamikdash, Bilbavi, Mishkan, Evden. That's the, that's the destination. And that's what we want. So the fire should all be extinguished. Rabbi Nachman says there's fire and there's light. There's ash, ma'ori ash, and ma'ori or. He says this on his word, Tisha B'Av. He says, if we're full of or, there's no Tisha B'Av. 
If we're not full of ore, then there's plenty of H to go around. So, yeah. When these people, the person dedicated themselves, after that, well, no, they paid money. They paid yeah. the money value. But, but understood it. But that's the point. If they've given their value to the base of Nikta, so that's just a physical exchange. But they purchase it. It's, it's as if, you know. Hopefully. Hopefully. What are, they, what are they doing it for? To raise you up to your Kedusha. Yeah, but I mean, these people went back to work or anything? But not the same. Of course they did. But they wanted to dedicate themselves, whatever they were doing, and to be higher, to be Mukdashim to the Beit I thought it was like something like a Shua, his mother. And by the way, and it's like everybody doing something else, you could dedicate this guy. See, I want to help that person reach a height. I want to help this person reach a height. I want my child to reach a height. I want my parents to reach that height. And that's how we do it. We lift each other up. Thank you, Rabbi.